Uh, we're going to be in John chapter 8 today. Before we go there, I want to remind you of words that David sang hundreds of years before Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Listen to these words. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, David had that sense in his life that there was goodness and mercy following him all his life. And now we're on the other side of the cross. We're in the New Testament times. And that goodness and that mercy have a face. That goodness and mercy have a name, and that name is Jesus. And uh, we've just been talking about how Jesus shows up in our life in all the different circumstances. We've looked at a, a skeptic and a seeker. Uh, we've looked at someone highly religious and very respected, someone highly irreligious and disrespected. Jesus showed up to all kinds of people in all kinds of circumstances and brought his hope, his love, his peace. You are being pursued. I like to say it this way. You're being pursued by a patient, perfect, persistent love. And sometimes you may move away from it. Sometimes I may move away from it. Sometimes we may uh, lean into it, but it's always there no matter what. No matter what circumstance you are in your life, there was Jesus. Today we're going to look at somebody having the worst day of their life and how Jesus shows up in the midst of that. So turn your Bibles, if you would, to uh, John chapter 8. I'm going to invite Hayden and, uh, and Cooper to come at this time, and they're going to bring the scripture reading, and we're going to lean into John's gospel today. Hear the word of God from the gospel according to John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple court, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. At, again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until the, the only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. You Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. God, for the people of God, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Appreciate it, guys. God bless you. I hope you love your Bible. You know, the Bible is so ancient and so relevant, so meaty and so complex. And, uh, you know, that's why when you, when you got your Bible in your hand, your paper version of your Bible, you know, there are little uh, footnotes and there are little references, a cross-reference is when the scripture you're reading relates to scripture some other way. It's good to run those down and say, well, what I'm reading here, how does it relate to something else that's said in scripture? And a footnote might let you know of a little textual variant or something you need to know about the text. And this text that we're studying today from John chapter 8 is one of those that has a big footnote. Uh, and that footnote says the oldest and best, the oldest and most reliable versions of John's gospel do not contain uh, these verses. So, so what, does that, what does that mean? You know, the reason why we're certain of what the Bible says is there's this science called textual criticism. This is fascinating stuff. Don't tune me out. Tune me in, okay? And that is studying ancient texts and and. 
and when we find a text maybe from Egypt, a fragment of the Gospel of John, and we compare it with a fragment from somewhere else, uh, and they say the same thing, we can be pretty sure the original said that. And the Bible, we have hundreds of different manuscripts floating around, different pieces. Some are just little fragments, and some are almost entire books. And uh, the earlier, obviously, the better. You know, the, the older the, the manuscript, the more reliable it is. It, because these things, all ancient manuscripts, were copied by hand. And so the earlier you go, the more faithful it is. This, this story, um, the, your footnote in your Bible will say it does not exist in the earliest and most reliable um, versions of John. So what does that mean? Well, it means John probably didn't write this. Uh, someone else probably added this in later. Uh, that doesn't make it untrue. You know, John says some things about his gospel. First of all, he says, uh, these things have I written. He gives his purpose for writing. This is in John chapter 20. These things have I written that you might, uh, that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that by believing you might have life in his name. It says Jesus did many other things which are not recorded in this book, okay? And then in John chapter 21, it says Jesus did other things as well. If ever one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. John's saying Jesus lived such a big life that if we, you tried to write everything down, it, the whole world would be a library. You could, you could talk about Jesus for that long, all the things he said and did. So what I like to believe about this passage is it's one of those stories somebody said is too good to leave out. You know, there were all these oral traditions, oral stories of Jesus that were passed around for years. And John had to make a lot, he had to leave a lot of great stuff on the cutting room floor. And I, I think this story is one people say, you know, you, can, you can't leave this one out. You can't leave this one out. And it has been one of the most beloved stories of Jesus. Be, and you know, it, it seems like Jesus, doesn't it? You know, from everything else we know about Jesus, this, this seems like something Jesus would definitely say, something he would definitely do. So uh, it has the authority of, of being consistent uh, with the rest, of, uh, the rest of what we know about Jesus. And so Jesus is in the temple here. And he is teaching, you know, uh, preachers, we stand up to preach. Rabbis, they tended to sit down to preach. That's, that was their custom. Uh, they, they sat in their teaching office and people gathered around to, to hear them. And Jesus is sitting, he's in the temple courts, the larger temple complex, and, and he's teaching. And his message gets interrupted by a group of scribes. Those are people that study and copy the scriptures and the Pharisees. These were the, this is one of the religious parties that taught the scriptures. And they brought a woman and put her in the midst. And they said, Jesus, we have caught this woman in the very act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Uh, the, the author here is uh, really clear that this is a test for Jesus. Uh, they're not really seeking justice. They're not really wondering what the right thing to do is here. Uh, they are trying to test Jesus to see what he would say. Uh, and it may be that they felt like they had him over a barrel here. You know, you could either go against Moses and say, you know, we shouldn't stone her. Uh, or you could go against the Roman government, which said, you, you know, the Romans are the only ones that can, can carry out the death sentence. So it may have been a, trying to put Jesus in that tension. Uh, we know that there was gamesmanship at work here. But let's just pause and think about this woman for a minute. Now, I'm, I know we have families tuning in together. I'm not going to get into gory detail here. But uh, she was caught in a very private moment and drug into the temple uh, for, to, to create this scene that they, that they wanted to create. I want to think about what she's experiencing here uh, for just a moment. You know, there, it's a bunch of guys standing around talking about killing her. So is it fair to say there's fear going on here? I think it's, I think it's reasonable to, to say that there's, there's fear going on. Um, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about fear because uh, it is, I think it's the real pandemic right now in our culture and in our world. It's not COVID-19. I think it's really fear, uncertainty. You see it in the stock market. You see it in, 
hoarding toilet paper when people really don't need toilet paper. They're just buying it because we just don't know, and groceries, and, and all these things. Uh, fear is just rife. So I want to talk a little bit about, about fear. You know, there is, um, there, there's a good side of fear uh, when we talk about the biological response. You know, God's designed us, if we are faced with a threat, our body reacts. There's, there's this chemical called adrenaline that gets pumped through our system. And that is, gives us the power to, you know, to fight or go into flight, you know, to run away or to, uh, 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 or to attack or whatever. When we're faced with a threat, our body, something happens in our body when we are startled, when we are afraid. And sometimes we do things we don't even know we can do. I heard a story a while back about a guy that his job was to dig a grave and he was he came in one late afternoon to to dig a grave for a funeral that was going to happen the next morning and he was a little bit absent minded and uh, kind of a simple guy and uh, he dug the grave a little deeper than what he'd planned on digging it and he actually dug himself into a hole and he couldn't get out. Now, of course, he could have taken the sides of the grave down and, and made a ramp and gone out, but that would have messed up the beautiful grave that he just dug. And so uh, he, this guy didn't stress about much. He said, well, I, I know what I'll do. I'll just, it's a nice night, stars are shining. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna uh, curl up here and the morning people will be along and they'll get, me out of the, they'll get me out of this hole. And so that's what he did. But about midnight, there was a guy, he'd had too much to drink. And he was taking a shortcut home through the cemetery and he stumbled into the grave and he fell in. And he starts trying to climb up the sides. He's on the other side and the guy wakes up and sees this guy and they're trying to get out. He said, friend, you'll never get out of here that way. But you know what he did? He did. <laughs> One jump, he was out. You can do things you don't know you can do when you have the right boost of adrenaline. But fear becomes unhealthy when it's... Uh, when it's just an ongoing anxiety that we live in. You know, anxiety is when we look at our circumstances and compare them with our resources. Uh, and, and it's toxic. Am I going to have enough? You know, there's even this thing called panic attacks where you kind of tamp the anxiety down for a while, but then it erupts back up again and it kind of seizes us. And there's blood pressure, there's physical symptoms, and it, we're not made to live in that. I changed my aquarium filters this week. We have a fish that's been with us for a long time. It's a goldfish, and he's blind. I didn't realize this for a long time, but he's blind. How do I know he's blind? He doesn't have eyes. If you look real closely, this fish, and you know what you call a fish without eyes? You know, so, okay, it's a bad joke. So I call him fish, and... Uh, <clears throat> And he's been with us a long time, but, but I changed his filter because they say, you know, if you don't, over time the ammonia builds up and you can't see it, but it's in the water and it's, it's toxic. And I think anxiety is that, is that toxicity in our culture. We're not made to, to live. So anxiety happens when we look at our circumstances and compare them with our resources. Let me tell you what peace is. Peace is when we look at our circumstances and compare them with God's resources and God's promises. You know, uh, if, if I compare the challenges to my resources, I'm going to be anxious. If I compare my situation with God's promises and God's resources, I'm, I'm going to have I'm going to have peace. You know, we all uh, believe in prayer, hopefully, and I hope you're spending time in prayer. But sometimes when we pray, we're really just kind of worrying on our knees. We're just kind of going through our list of anxieties. That's not very life-giving. Where you need to get to in a place of prayer is trust in your Heavenly Father. And say, God, I trust you. You know, sometimes we say, okay, I got faith. You know, think about something you're praying for. You know, I'm praying that we can have Easter worship in this church. Wouldn't that be great? By April 12th, COVID-19 is eradicated. We can come together. Maybe Easter Sunday is our first Sunday back. And we'll pack this place out and be so joyful. I want that so much. I'm praying for that even. But if I'm not careful, I'm setting myself up for disappointment. Because I've got my outcome that I want. I want us all to be together Easter. And that may or may not be what happens. And if my faith is in that, I might be disappointed. 
But let me tell you what, if my faith is God no matter what, if we have to worship online for a long, long time, if we have to change everything we do normally, God, you're going to be faithful through that. You're going to take care of us. You're going to make sure the gospel goes forth. You're going to be true to your word. If my faith is in God, not just what I want God to do, then I'm going to start to have peace because that's the relationship of trust with our Heavenly Father. So um, this woman is in, is in fear. She's in anxiety. And um, I, I want to also say that, um, that, that she's in shame. Okay? She's also walking in shame. Uh, can you imagine being drugged into the temple? You know, we can just kind of get an image in our mind, what she looked like, what she was feeling, and, and this overwhelming feeling of shame. You know, um, you ever had that dream when you were a kid, and maybe you are a kid, okay, where you show up to school in your pajamas or your underwear? You ever had that dream? I've had that dream before. Everybody talks about that dream because it's a recurring thing. It turns out now that's okay. You can show up to school if you're homeschooled, right, in your pajamas, and that's no, no shame in that, right? But, uh, but we've all had that, uh, that feeling of being exposed. That's something that's a deep-seated fear in all of us. And this woman was exposed. Her life was exposed. And you know how it is, you know, people don't usually just start out and do the wrong thing. There's usually a process. When, when we make bad decisions, when we do the wrong thing, um, you know, let's say you work at a bank. And if they asked you the first day you came to work, are you going to steal from this bank? You say, absolutely not. I wouldn't do that. That would be wrong. But then as you go along, maybe an opportunity, you, you recognize an opportunity, and with an opportunity becomes temptation. And there's kind of this internal dialogue that we do with ourselves that say, okay, you know, I've looked at other people in my field that have a similar job. I'm paid 15% less than those other people. I'm owed something here. You know, and everybody else, they kind of, you know, they take the opportunities they see to, to get ahead a little bit, provide for their family. You know, why shouldn't I do the same where I'm at? And you start this internal process of justification, why it's okay for you to do the wrong thing. But the thing is, as soon as you're caught, that thing is like a house of cards. It just comes crashing down. Right? Because you, you've built this. It's why it's so important to be in the Word of God. Because we've got to compare our thinking with God's Word. Because the worst kind of deception is self-deception. When we deceive ourselves. And so this, this, uh, this woman has been in a long pattern of self-deception. And now all that's coming crashing down. She's realized what she's done. And, you know, we see the duplicity in this moment. I don't know how you catch one person committing adultery. I don't, I, I've never understood this story from that point of view, but she's obviously the one that has been selected to be put on display, and she is uh, thrown out in the midst of all these folks, and, and, and she is, she's put on display. The, the Pharisees and the scribes say, Jesus, this is what the law of Moses says. What, should, what do you say? What do you say? Now, Jesus does something very interesting. And there's been a ton of debate on this passage. What, is, what was Jesus doing? Jesus kneels down and he writes on the ground. And everybody wants to know, what was he writing? What was he writing? And the real answer is nobody knows. When we get to heaven one day, we'll get to maybe ask Jesus, what in the world was he, what were he writing back there in John chapter 8? You know, some say he was writing the Ten Commandments. So the, all the people around there could see, well, that's one of the commandments, but there's other commandments too. And, and one of those you, you've broken, you guys that are standing around here. Uh, St. Jerome, back in the day, he, he wrote that Jesus wrote the names of the people that were her accusers. So, um, you know, that's interesting. Some people have suggested that Jesus was writing uh, Exodus chapter 23, verse 1, which is commandment of, about, against being a malicious witness. In other words, being a witness against somebody to get your own advantage instead of to seek justice. You know, and that's certainly what they were doing here. They, they were doing this not to bring justice. They were doing this to test Jesus and try to get an advantage. So maybe Jesus was writing, um, you know, John, um, Exodus chapter 23, verse 1. 
But Jesus also could have just been doodling. You know? Uh, you know, you don't have to participate in everybody's drama. You know, they were, they were putting on a show. They meant this is a moment of high drama. They're powering up. Jesus just pretends not to play here. You know, he's, he's, uh, he's not participating in the drama. My family and I sometimes like to play board games, and we're pretty competitive. So, me and some of my kids are really competitive. There's a game called Risk. I don't know if you ever play Risk, but Risk is a game of global domination. You're trying to take over the world, and your armies are attacking other people's armies. And I tell you what, at my house, a game of Risk can get intense. Some of our big family stories about big things that happen, I mean, have to do around the game Risk, you know, things that were said and done, because we get into it. Now, I'm married to a woman. Becky is not uh, competitive at all, and she doesn't really like all the competition stuff. And so she'll play with us because she wants to be part of the family activity. But she'll be like over here lining up all her pieces, you know. And she doesn't care if she wins or not, you know. She's just, I wonder if I can get all the blue ones right in a row there. You know, she's got her own little game going on there because she didn't want to participate in our drama. And I kind of think maybe Jesus was just doing that. Maybe he was doodling. I always got trouble in trouble in school because I was doodling. I listened better actually when I doodled. So sometimes teachers didn't get that about me. I'm actually paying attention, but uh, I'm just over here doing something else for a minute. And they keep demanding an answer for Jesus. So Jesus gets up and he says something very, very famous. He said, let you who are without sin cast the first stone. Okay, you're going to stone this woman. Let's start with the one that has never sinned before. And the Bible says here in John chapter 8 that starting with the older ones, you know, there is some wisdom that comes with age. Starting with the older ones, they dropped their rocks and they walked away. Until Jesus is left alone. It's just Jesus and the woman. And Jesus has gone back to writing on the ground. He gets up and says, woman, where are your accusers? Are, did they all go away? And she says, yes, there's, there's none here to accuse me. Then Jesus says this. He says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You know, it's such an important phrase because neither do I condemn thee is a word of mercy. Okay. Go and sin no more is a word of reset and redemption and new possibilities and new commands. You know, we kind of got this uh, feeling in our culture that you've got to accept everything about me and everything I do or you don't, or you're condemning me. Uh, Jesus doesn't condemn, but he, does, he says you need to change your lifestyle and you're going to have an opportunity for a reset here. Both, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. I'm not coming in for a close here. And I want you to see today how Jesus transformed fear and shame. You know, one thing we say about Jesus during this time of the year, and hopefully we remember it all year long, is that Jesus took on our shame. Um, Isaiah 53, I'm going to read some words to you. It's not, the words aren't going to be up on your screen. I just want you to hear them, but the reference will be up on the screen. Isaiah 53, I want you to hear these words. A prophecy of Jesus. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, he did not open his mouth. Jesus took on our shame. In that same city where Jesus pronounced mercy and forgiveness to this woman, 
Jesus himself would be spit upon, beaten, and executed. He took our shame upon himself. But I had this thought this week. What did Jesus do with our shame? Well, he took it with him to his grave. Jesus entered into the most fearful thing we know about, and that is death. But thanks be to God, he, overcome, he overcomes the grave. He raises victorious. He didn't bring our shame out of the grave. He left it there. And he rose victorious. And just as Jesus rose to new life, he raises us to new life as well. He has borne our shame. He has buried it. And he's opened up a new beginning for us. Thanks be to God. And that's our word too. Neither do I condemn thee. That's a word of merciful grace. Go and sin no more. That's a word of hope, empowerment, and redeeming love. Our shame has been crucified. Our fear has been overcome overcome. Jesus has conquered all. And so today we're living in God's redeeming love. We're living in new beginnings, fresh opportunities to serve and to love God, knowing our past is handled by his grace. I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Would you bow your heads right where you are this morning? And let's uh, receive his grace and let's receive the new beginning that he wants to bring us. We agree, Lord, with Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have lived as prisoners to fear and shame. We have done things that we ourselves know are not the right thing to do. And we thank you that though we deserve condemnation, you're not a God of condemnation. You're a God of mercy, new beginnings. You're a God of grace. Jesus, I thank you that you took our shame. Everything we've ever said wrong, thought wrong, done wrong. Things that we're, if, it, if anybody else knew them, we'd be deeply, deeply ashamed. You took all of that to the grave. And you rose without that stuff. That means you left it there. You buried our shame. And you rose to newness of life. So we have a new beginning with you. If there's anybody watching this morning that hasn't said yes to you, Jesus, I'm just going to say it one more time for me and in all of our hearts, we'll just say it again. Jesus, be our Lord. Forgive us of our sins. May we follow you in the newness of life. Not living in fear, not living in shame, living in trust, living in joyful obedience to your will. We ask this in your holy name.